All right, let's go. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to talk about tools and apps, obviously, and we're going to give you the latest and greatest what we did during the last year since maybe we talked to you last year and especially in the last, uh, in the last month. We're going to go more in detail on what we uh, discussed during the keynotes. Uh, quick warm-up slide last year in numbers. I will skip rapidly on that. When we, then we'll talk about all the efforts we've made to integrate the cloud tools. So we're going to start with the uh, with the cloud tools. Um, I think we did a, a, a pretty good progress in terms of integrating them. We're going to show that to you. We're going to give you a quick demo, especially going through inventory. Uh, the, so the cloud inventory, which is called inventory online. We're going, to look, we're going to go quickly through the hardware as well as software, which has been introduced a few uh, a few months ago. So maybe you haven't seen the new software inventory that um, Inventory Online does. So it's a good opportunity to see it. Then a, the 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 new kid in the block. It's called Contracts. We'll uh, we'll, sh we'll show it to you quickly. We'll explain what the value is and we'll ask you a few a uh, few questions. Then we're going to talk about Help Desk uh, quickly. Cloud Help Desk. We're not going to go too much on it because there's not too many. Uh, people in the room who run it. Then we're going to go to reporting. So that's going to be kind of a kind of a cloud uh, topic as well, because reporting is, is I, I'd say, OK, if not decent, if not good for many of you on the desktop side. That's something which is not as developed yet on the cloud side of things. Actually, maybe that's what many of you complain about. And that's why you haven't made the, the move to, uh, to the cloud tools. We see many people say, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move off the desktop. I'd like to go to the cloud tools. It's fine with me. But the reporting is not good enough. So we heard that. Am I hearing some good nodding here? OK, that's good. So, um, so we'll talk about reporting, and we'll show you not a finished product, but we've done some good, let's say, prototyping for now. It's actually pretty advanced prototyping, because you could make it work at home. And we'll explain you how to, uh, to do it at the end of this, uh, of this session. But we're pretty happy with um, the prototype, and we really want your feedback on the direction. Is that a direction you like? And based on your feedback, we'll certainly uh, influence our uh, decisions moving forward. Then we're going to talk about deployment, right? The endless question on prem versus uh, cloud. We'll talk about desktop. Probably most of you know in what state the desktop is, and we're going to confirm and answer some of your uh, questions. And of course, we'll talk about help desk server, which I presented yesterday during the keynotes as being basically the. Uh, the uh, on-prem version of the Cloud Help Desk. This is the code base that we would like, and we've pretty much decided, at least for now, to uh, build um, kind of the replacement of the desktop. Desktop's not going away. There's a slide at the end to tell you all that story. What should you do? Probably nothing. Maybe test the new stuff. But there's no urgency of, of, of any kind. Uh, but Help Desk Server is the platform we're going to build on uh, for that. The reason is performance, and we'll have a couple of slides on that. And then, because we're in the deployment section, we'll talk about agents, which is what we uh, use to collect detailed uh, inventory um, uh, details and information. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk about deployment of these agents and that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a full agenda. So let's go. Last year's in numbers, nothing really. Uh, I guess it's kind of a warm-up slide. That's a lot. That's many of you. That's many of of, of you as businesses that run these products, that scan their software, scan their devices and their hardware, uh, create tickets with uh, the two products we have to do that today, uh, and deploy the agents. Everything is de includes desktop and cloud in this slide, except the uh, agents deployed. We have not counted. I'm hearing a little bit of, um, of, um, of sound here. Uh, feedback. Um, so those are the agents on the cloud side and not on the desktop side, even though you can. I'm sure many of you have deployed the agents on the desktop side, uh, even though there are some limitations. You've heard probably of the 100-ish agents limitation. It's, it's, it's a true limitation. You're not going to have that issue in the cloud, um, in the cloud inventory uh, because it's designed to scale from, from an agent deployment perspective. We'll come back to that at the end. Uh, all right, so I'm not going to spend a long time. You, you guys know that. But in terms of positioning, what, we, what we're doing in terms of managing your, uh, helping you manage your IT um, is pretty much uh, the inventory uh, application. You know about that. That's what kind of discovers uh, your network in more or less details. Um, monitor, we still have the network monitor. It's kind of in the same state as desktop um, in the sense that we're not, we need to really fix that if it's possible. Um, uh, really, fix, uh, really, um, really monitor your uh, network and your devices. The, it's in the same state as the desktop in the sense that it's not actively being um, uh, developed. We're planning to um, 
uh, improve that not on that basis, but using something called the connectivity dashboard. We'll go probably during one minute through the connectivity dashboard just to make sure you know what that is. And if you're interested, you can start it at home. But that's the platform we'll, we'll, we may be using in the future to uh, deliver more monitoring capability. That being said, network monitor is still there. You can still download it. You can still use it. Uh, if, you, if you have uh, support issues, support will um, uh, certainly help you resolve those issues as far as, far as possible. Uh, it's unlikely we're going to do a, f a patch uh, for fixing feature issues unless everybody would be affected. What we would fix would be security issues. If there was security vulnerabilities discovered either on desktop or on network monitor, we would fix them. We, we, we keep uh, looking at the CVs that are being published and reported every month. Ben and I are looking at them or assessing the, uh, how dangerous they are potentially and we decide to fix or not fix. So that's kind of the status for both desktop and network monitor. Troubleshooting is the connectivity dashboard. We'll go through that in a, in a few minutes and obviously track your uh, end user activity and track your ticket with the help desk. So that's the scope of what we do. IT management is an enormous space. I mean, there are dozens of different types of application, application monitoring and, and that, kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, we want to, to focus on the essentials, which we believe is that. That's what you need to do minimally, in our opinion, if you are managing IT. Nothing prevents you to go more sophisticated. There's plenty of vendors on the Spiceworks platform, thinking of the PRTG, of the SolarWinds, of the IBM, of the, you name it, there's plenty, they're all here. Just discover them on the Spiceworks platform and move up to them. That's kind of our job as well to help you start. If you have essential needs, we'll cover you. If you need to go more sophisticated, we'll cover you by helping you discover partners uh, that operate on our platform. Okay, integrated ecosystem of cloud tools. I'll start with this one. You see on the left-hand side, so we're in the cloud area. We introduced that a few months ago. That's the uh, kind of the, uh, it's a navigation. So we call it the, the, the side nav or the left nav. Uh, it literally looks like that. You'll see that in a, in a minute. And that's how in a single click you can navigate between these different integrated software. You can see their name in the call out. So the cloud help desk is there. Then you can move to the uh, inventory hardware and inventory software the vendor contract tool, and the connectivity dashboard. So those are all the cloud tools. There are some smaller tools on the slash tools page. But um, in terms of um, the integrated ecosystem of cloud tools, this is what we are uh, talking about. And the integration goes deeper than just clicking on one to jump from one to the other. Uh, you, you have on the right-hand side, and we'll, we'll demo that um, as well in a minute, is the possibility to reference devices from tickets. So if you're on cloud help desk, it says I'm opening a ticket and that ticket relates to a device which happens to be in your inventory, you can connect your ticket to that device. And when you're, and then you, you do that, you leave, your best buddy comes and works on this ticket and says, what device is that? You just have to click on the little card which is there and you navigate seamlessly to the inventory. You get all the hardware details and software details for that device. So you can process the ticket and troubleshoot the problem, whatever that is, and you can do the opposite. When you're in the inventory and you see a ticket, uh, sorry, a device that has a ticket attached to it, if you click on that ticket name or ticket number, you're going to get navigate seamlessly into Cloud Help Desk. So bidirectional integration between the two. Let's do a quick demo. All right. Can you? Uh, can, I'll, I'll do it. If you can move your. Uh, I'm not a Mac person. I'm a PC person. I just usually don't touch these things. I usually, I usually hurt myself. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the support, guys. He doesn't believe me when I say. Anyway, let's not go there. All right. <laughs> okay. So I'll. Uh, we're in device inventory. Let's start that. So basically, uh, the main thing you have to know on device uh, on the on the inventory online. Uh, device inventory is it's agent based and there's two agents. I'm actually going to uh, show you this. Um, there's two, th that's a very important screen if you haven't seen it before. That screen is important because it explains, and believe me, many people don't read it. We all know that. We all do the same thing, but that's a really important one. We have a scanning agent and a collection agent. The scanning agent is basically a scanner. You run it, usually IT pros run it on their workstation. It runs on Windows and Mac, and basically it does a ping sweep of whatever subnet you want to scan. You give the subnets to this agent and say, all right, scan this, go take a coffee, you come back, and the agent has discovered as much as possible based on what device has responded to, um, to the ping. So when you do that, 
you're going to see a result that, that kind of looks like this, a bunch of lines, it's pretty boring, but that's, your, uh, that's what's connected to your network. But you're not going to see all the columns. You're not going to see um, operating system, or rarely, you're not going to see, um, you're going to see manufacturer, you're not going to see models, you're not going to see uh, what's at the end here, all that stuff, the last user, the owner of, the, uh, of this device, the serial number, all that you're not going to see. So how did that make up uh, on that screen? Well, the reason for this information to be there is that to do that, you need to install the collection agents. So why do we do that? So, sorry. And the collection agent is something you install on each workstation. If you want to discover all these details, and it's actually more than all these columns I just showed you, if you want the software inventory, for example, which I'll go through in a minute, you need to install the collection agent. So I'll pause here for a second and try to contrast what we do here with desktop. Desktop has the same agent to do the same kind of stuff, but that was not the preferred option for desktop, for desktop inventory to discover. We were scanning, and we're doing so, something we call the deep scan, which is uh, based on WMI at least on, on workstations. And so there's pros and cons between the two. WMI, you don't need to install an agent on the target workstation that you want to discover, right? It's a Microsoft protocol that is established to try to scan deeply. Long story short, over the years, we've decided to stop using, at least for now, WMI, because it's, it's, we, ha we had quite a bit of issues. I mean, these guys were in support before. It was a lot of pain. WMI not being started on that machine, not having the right version, not being authorized to run for security. There was always a good reason why WMI was not, was not working. So I see some, some people nodding as well. <laughs> so, we said, <laughs> so we said, all right, let's, let's, let's try the agent. So the agent is a little bit more, requires a little bit more work at the beginning because you need to deploy the agent, right? So yes. It's so it's we have agents for both, but it's not the same. So the agent, the, if you don't, yes. Yeah. So the collection agent, uh, you distribute it on those workstations. You can do it manually if you don't have too many. You can use GPU on worksta on uh, Microsoft machines. Many people use PDQ Deploy, which is a free software. People seem to be very happy with it. We have no preference. Just push the agent for what, for, with whatever technique you want to use. Some people kind of burn a master image of their PC, and every time they re-image a new PC, the agent is already on it. It's possible as well. So whatever technique is your favorite technique to distribute that stuff, we'll, we'll be happy to support it. It's just an MSI. You run it, and that's it. Um, OK, so long story short, if you deploy these collection agents, then you're going to have much more details, such as all these fancy columns I just uh, showed you. But if you click on one machine, this one, whatever, you're going to have this panel that shows up, and you're going to see kind of the same, the same kind of stuff you saw in the columns, but you're going to see more from a hardware perspective. Uh, this is probably self-explanatory. I'll let you read it. A little bit more details on storage and the hard drives, a little bit more detail on the RAM. You see the number of slots available for RAM, then network information, then ticket information. I'm purposely skipping software. You can create a ticket from here. So remember, I said that's a bidirectional integration. So if you click here, you can now create a ticket, and that ticket's going to be in the Cloud Help Desk. The same Cloud Help Desk you have, you can access here. Okay, it says, oh, I have a problem on this machine. The user complains about blah, blah, blah. And now at that point, the ticket and the device um, will, be, uh, will be connected uh, to each other. I'll show you more in a minute about that. All right, let's talk about software for a sec. All right, so here is the list of software that have been detected by that collection agent. So again, you've installed the collection agent. Remember, forget the scanning. Scanning is just ping, just to tell you the device exists. If you want to go deep on this device, you install the collection agent, and it tells you that. It tells you this is the list of software I've discovered. Think of it as what you would see in the control panel slash uh, programs and apps, whatever it's called, right? If you go there, you're going to have the list of software. It pretty much taps into the same database on the machine to retrieve the installed um, software base. And you have everything, um, uh, in, 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 including the installation dates, the name of the software, the name of the vendor, the, um, the uh, version. So if you say, why is it? that they all have 1.3.3.7. doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. It's because it's depersonalized data. It's our network we've scanned. But for security reasons, we have to kind of depersonalize the data. So just don't worry about it. Don't pay attention to that. Security, security. 
All right. Um, so that's kind of what the collection agent gives you in terms of details. So now you may say, well, that's all good, but I have, uh, what is it, 47 machine on that uh, that I've discovered. I have 47 different inventory, software inventory on each of these machines. How do I see a combined view of everything, right? So, it, so the system could tell me the list of all software installed across all my, um, uh, uh, all my IT and discovered across my network. So then you go to the second view. You see I click here. So now we're talking about software inventory. And think of of it as the, the, the union, the merge of all the, the individual software inventory I just showed you, right? Just showed you one. Imagine we took the 47 machine, we merged them, we would get that list here, including the number of machines that each software, obviously many software will be detected on more than one machine. Here is the example. Just so you know, the first one, Agent Shell, is actually our own agent, so you understand what happened. We pushed our agent, and then we said, ask this agent, please collect the software installed, and the agent detected itself, right? So it's, it's the agent saying, well, I'm here. Um, yeah, me too. Um, so uh, that's kind of interesting. If you, based on the kind of software and how you pay licenses, um, it's so sometimes you may be interested to know how many seats you've installed with that software, if it's a paid software. If you bought like 10 licenses and you're, you've installed 24, eh, maybe you want to be clean with that vendor. If you've bought 200 licenses and you've deployed on with 24, well, you bought 170 seats for nothing, so maybe there's something to think of in terms of maybe scaling down and not renewing your contract with this vendor. You see how oh, elegant, yeah. Where are you going elegant this, transition is moving oh. on to the contract section. You see, I'm getting better every <laughs> year. I learn a new trick. All right, so the, so the contract is the fourth one here, you see here. So we've introduced that a few months ago. And it's a pretty simple tool, at least for now. It could become more um, sophisticated in the future. Um, but the idea is we've heard many people saying we don't have a good system for really, we don't have a, a trusted list of all the contracts that exist in the company that people refer to that when there is a change in any contract we go to and do the change so everybody is aware of what happened in the contract list and at any time anybody knows what contract we had with what vendor. We didn't hear that. We, we heard it's a mess. We do through emails or we have an Excel spreadsheet and we don't share it well. And even if we share it, there is a feature that we would love is when the contract is about to expire 30, 60 days before, I'd like to be warned that the contract is going to expire, so now is my remember, now is my time to contact that vendor and maybe say, all right, listen, I don't like this software, I'm not gonna renew it, I don't want to pass the deadline, so I'm telling you now, just I'm not renewing next year. Or maybe you like it and you want to renegotiate the price. Anyway, the point is you may want to, 30, 60, 90 days before, do something uh, with this vendor and as a reminder have the system remind you which is kind of difficult to do with an Excel spreadsheet So we heard all these use cases and this um, and these uh, needs and we said let's do a very simple list right here It is you can populate it. it doesn't populate automatically right now you do it manually But once you've done it, it's kind of easy to maintain and it does indeed coming to your question in a sec uh, and it does indeed um, and it does indeed remind you. So if you look at how you edit or create a new contract, you put the name, the vendor, you have a long list of, uh, of vendors, uh, but you can, you can put your own, same thing for product services. And if you populate an end date here, you'll have this and says, please warn me 30, 60, 90, 120 days before. And if you do, you'll receive an email that says, hey, it's time to contact, it's time to think about that contract. Do what you want with it, but I'm telling you, in 60 days, that contract will expire. If you want to do something, now is the time. Uh, and you can take notes, you can say, hey, I hate that product, or I would love that software, we want to renew, but maybe cheaper. You can put the support um, contact number, you can put your account number. If you talk to this vendor, you don't need to go to your emails and say, what was that uh, contract number again? Location, and so on. Yes, a few questions. Right, this guy has first, yes. Yes, we've had one issue. It usually works pretty well. We've had one issue like a year ago. Was it Kaspersky? Can you remember? I think Kaspersky, I know, Kaspersky uh, yeah. kind of uh, screamed at it. He says, whoa, 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 that's a virus. And 
I'm see, I can't remember what we do. Yeah, we don't usually have complaints for that one. We've had them in the past with desktop, um, but typically that was actually the desktop app itself. There were like libraries and that sort right. of thing that got flagged. That remember the number 140,000 on the first slide? So if we've heard, we would, we would have heard it if we had yeah. a large scale issue. Once in a while, Kaspersky or whoever has a new version, eh, they bark, we says, no, no worry, whitelist it, and, and we're good. Down here. No, it's a great question. Yes. And tell Francois right here. Yeah. Is there a way to like save that as a CSV and then no. oh. Thank you for asking this question, which I get every day. No, but that's a great that's an obvious that's an obvious one. I guess it's a very early version. We're collecting feedback. If you guys like it, that is not difficult to do. We'll do it. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> multiple being multiple people or multiple time the same person? That's a great one. We, we could check. We could check. Yeah, we could check multiple. I haven't had that idea. That's an awesome one. Like a snooze, yeah. I love that. The alarm clock. If you fall asleep. Okay, so if you fall asleep for 30 days, then after 30 days, the system wakes you up again. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that one. All right, on this side. Yeah, absolutely. That's how we would do it. Yes. So there is no connection between who installed the agent and who, and who can see the inventory. I think probably what you're talking about is you can invite. Um, yes, that's folks. Yeah. that's what you want to. That's go ahead, Ben. But that's yeah. the answer to your question. Yeah. So it's a co it it happens to be a coincidence. The answer is there. Yeah. So whoever's got the list, they can come here and invite. And if you've got a situation where you try to invite and it gives you an error message and says something, you know, you know, I can't add them or whatever, um, support can get you sorted out, get your accounts combined so you can right. both see the same information. Yeah. So the person who created the account with inventory is kind of the, the owner, and then this person needs to invite as many as you want with this window so that other that list of other person can access it. And again, whoever installed the agent is irrelevant. Yes. Can you pass off the ownership of that account to another? All right, I had the question last week and I don't know, but... You yeah, may. so basically you just invite them and then the, there's not a lot of granularity to the access. And so once you've added someone else, they're basically an equal level of administrator. And then they, they could remove you or you could, uh, you could contact support and then, you know, you leave the company and they could contact yeah, that, support and get you taken right. off. Okay. Yeah. The RIP manager is ready to retire the end of the year. Gotcha. Yeah. And so right. we're going through a lot of this. Who's going to pick up this piece? Yeah. Here's yeah, the yeah. answer. Yes. Yep. Yes. There has been no change on desktop in the last year. Yes. All right. Let's move on. Great question, guys. Um, all right. So that's contract. And then I'll say a few words about connectivity dashboard that has not been any change in the last um, year. So I'll go very briefly for whoever didn't know that colorful thingy. So what that thingy does is think of it as a kind of a bunch of lines and columns, right? So each line here is one agent that you've installed. Again, this is demo data, so don't, normally you should see 47. Remember the 47, you should see 47 lines. And the idea is every agent that's installed on the workstations, in addition to being, um, uh, to doing the detailed local scan, right, with inventory, software inventory and all that, kind of does, if you want, test, usually pings or HTTP gets, just test to see if whatever is defined as a column is reachable from that workstation. So what that tells you, if you have a green cell between the line and the column, it means that this agent, right, the last one, too short. So this guy here, can it, can it reach Spiceworks or not? It's probably spiceworks.com. And if the answer is yes right now, it's a real-time tool, it's in green. If it works but it's slow, it's in yellow. And if it doesn't work, it's in red. So when you see something like this, that's the vi visual signature of the fact that every agent, every line, is not in a position to reach that unique URL or IP address. It's a printer. So that means that basically this printer, wherever it is in your IT, is not reachable by anybody. It means that if you have an accounting group and that accounting group needs that printer to work, that they are not able to print right now. And you can do that with, uh, click on this, 
This is the link you, this is the screen you use to define the columns. You define the display name, you define the uh, IP uh, or host name or resolvable name, like www.spicerox.com, and you can say if it's an HTTP or if it's an ICMP. You have two ways to test. If it's just an IP address, there is no web server, just ping it, ICMP. If it's, some, if it's a web application, you ask the agent, the line, please do an HTTP get to this address. If you get the proper HTTP response, color the, color the cell in green. It's as simple as that. Uh, one question we have often, so I anticipate it, is when this kind of stuff happens, there is no alert today. We're planning to do it. It's going to be done. It's not very difficult to do. But how, you see what just happened? That's just an agent that was not detectable. So for, for ju we, we just lost the connectivity with this agent, which may not be a problem. This guy maybe shut down his laptop and left or whatever. At night, most of these will be dark because these agents don't work. The PCs are shut down. All the Macs are shut down. This works on, also on Mac. Therefore, nobody can connect because the agent is not running. So it's a perfectly normal situation or not. If you have a bunch of this at 3 PM, you have a networking problem because nobody can't re you can't reach the agents anymore. There's the problem somewhere. All right. OK, let's move back to the slides. Checking the time. All right. So. Um, I think we're good on that. A lot of good questions. We can stay a little bit longer after vendor contract. You've uh, you've seen it. What's your last? What's your feeling on the vendor contract? Is that something you can be helpful for you guys? Would you take thirty minutes to put your information in there? And that's it. I have my trusted list. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Question there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, no, that's a great one. Thank you for your input. Contact your sales manager. Okay, that's easy. It's just more fields. Okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah, that's a great one. Uh, we'll do it. We have that question all the time. People say, yeah. listen, if it's supposed to be a self-contained list, just, just do it. Just upload the PDF. Let me upload my PDFs and my contracts, and that's it. That's really my undisputed trusted list. That's a great one, and that's on the list already. Yes. I've been putting links to our one that are shared. Good move. That's that's the uh, that's the workaround. But it would be so much simpler if it was uploaded in yeah. the tool, and that's it. All right, one more, and then we'll move. Okay, two more, and we'll move forward. Uh, a way to export the PDF to share with department. So you can ex yes, you, can, you see the export. You can export to CSV, and it g gives you proper CSV in Excel, and you can give it to somebody. Yes. No, but we that's that's also in the plan because. If you bought those devices, basically you have a contract with the vendor because you bought these devices or you have a maintenance contract. So it's kind of obvious that at some point we should seed or populate that list from what we discover from your inventory. We could populate it from the hardware we discovered, create a contract for those vendor. Software, same thing. Maybe you don't want to put everything because that would be a long list, but maybe the most important one you want to keep. So it's an obvious one and that's on the list as well. It's a great input. All right, let's move on. All right, Cloud Help Desk Insights. We're not going to do a demo in the interest of time. That's something we introduced. You know what? I'm going to skip it because there's not enough Cloud Help Desk people. I'll say just one thing because Insight is really important. When you see at the top, we're starting to, um, uh, to create, um, to basically surface through the application, and you'll see more in inventory and, and, and Cloud Help Desk as well. Surface information that helps you make decisions, better understanding, uh, better understand your um, your uh, your IT. And this one here, if you can read it, uh, but if you can't, I'll read it for you. Um, you process your tickets normally, and at some point you're going to have that thing popping up. It says you seem to have more activity related to networking than we typically see. So what we're telling you is, we're looking because it's in the cloud. We're looking at your tickets, and you seem to have way more activity in terms of networking than other people. You don't know who, obviously, we're never going to tell you who. We don't disclose those details. But other people using Cloud Help Desk have, in majority, much less ticket than you have. We're giving you the information. What do you do with it? What you want. You may do nothing, says it's perfectly normal. We just deployed a new networking system. We have problems. Everything is under control. Ignore it. Close it. No problem. Or maybe you can say, 
you know, I suspected we had a lot of issues, and I think the networking is, uh, network is getting worse and worse. We have more and more problems. We kind of feel it, but we don't have the data to prove it. Maybe that's something that helps you go to your boss and says, you see, I told you where things are degrading from a network perspective. Now that thing pops up and Spiceworks is comparing us to others, kind of baselining us against others, and we seem to struggle from a networking standpoint. So maybe that could be the starting point for a good discussion um, or maybe some action that says, all right, that's it. We're going to change that Wi-Fi access point because we have too many problems and 10% of our tickets come from that. That's the trigger. We're going to make the decision based on that. That's kind of the idea of the insights in helping you make decision or at least ask yourself the right questions about your age. Okay, I won't say more, I'll skip the connections. If you have questions about that, you can come back after, you can come after. All right, reporting. So remember that is not desktop related, that is cloud, but like many of you uh, have told us like at the beginning of this session, many of you are considering moving to the cloud or even for help desk to help desk server. But reporting was the uh, it's not good enough. So we've been thinking about that since last year, and um, we've been making some progress. Um, the ge I'll, I'll give you the general idea, and then Ben is going to give you a, a, a quick demo of that. The idea we have right now is, and we're not saying it's final, but at least that's the direction we've, uh, we're considering right now, is what if we made it very easy to export your inventory data? You see export. If you click on it, you have all inventory uh, data, if you can read the, from, the, from, the bar, from the back of the room. If you're in help desk, same thing. You're, you go into the uh, reporting tab here. And then you go to you create a new report and you say, I want to export this report in Excel access. This option has been introduced like what, two, two weeks ago, a week ago? Yeah. So before you had CSV and JSON only. Again, we're talking cloud help desk here. You XLX uh, export your uh, tickets and then you take your favorite um, reporting slash business intelligence tool and you open the, f the file you just exported, XLS, and, and you, now you have all your data into a very flexible and powerful reporting tool and, and you can create your own reports. So what you're going to see is us taking a stab at what would be a good report. It's just a template. It's not part of the application. If you're interested in testing it, we'll give you at the end the way to do it. We can give you that template in Power BI. You can try it at home. Come back to us in a week or two and tell us what you think. Talk about that at the end. So we're not saying this is not about being formally integrated with Power BI. This is us having done a prototype in Power BI. It says, let's try to see what Power BI does if we exported the data from the tool and we fed it into it, right? So you see the difference between a formal integration and just a test. Uh, and this is not us saying we have a library of 10 different or 20 different reports, right, that do this and do that, and you're free to use them. We may get there at some point, but we're not there yet. Right now, it's just basically one report that we've done as a proof of concept to prove that it's possible to get pretty interesting reports from the data we generate from these tools and uh, in a fairly simple fashion. So um, Ben is going to give you a quick demo. Before I let him go, uh, Power BI is one. We've done it with another. We're not, we don't care about Power BI. It happens to be a Microsoft tool. Many of you are Microsoft. Um, there's pros and cons. Tableau is a pretty good business intelligence tool. You could use Tableau. Um, so, uh, but Power BI was the, the, it has a free version, that's, that's the one, there is a free version of Power BI. I don't think there is a free version of Tableau as far as I know. Check with your favorite sales rep, but uh, it's kind of why we chose Power BI. All right. Ready? Oh, yeah. Let's take a look. So this is Power BI. So like Francois said, uh, you've got those export options available in both applications. Um, once you export, uh, what we'd like to do again, is try to get you guys effectively a template in Power BI, uh, again, for this kind of experimental testing, prototyping phase, um, so that there's not a lot of, um, I don't know, massaging of the data, right? There's not a lot of um, moving things around. You can just take that file out of inventory or out of help desk, push it into that template in Power BI, and then boom, all of this uh, information is populated. So uh, I'll, I'll start here in inventory. This is, you can see across the bottom, there's some tabs here. This is inventory report. So I've imported the data into Power BI here, and it's gonna um, populate all of these kind of like dashboard widgets for me here. So across the bottom, you see a couple different bits of information. Bottom left, you've got um, free uh, drive space available on devices, and so 
It's a quick look at um, that imported information you saw in that interface and in the inventory interface. It had the details of drive space, the details of RAM, and those sorts of things. So we're reflecting that here, and the intention is to give you guys um, the specifics at a level uh, that you can see across your environment all at once and target and uh, specifically see drive space or uh, software that's installed or RAM that's available so you can take action. The goal here is to, is to provide you a mechanism to take action on <coughs> these devices. So uh, that's what you've got here across the bottom. Again, drive space, RAM, got that uh, slot count. And then over here on the right, um, this is something that you can customize within Power BI. So uh, we just picked for the purpose of demo um, some older versions of Firefox and GoToMeeting. The intention was, you know, what if I need to be doing a security sweep every month or something like that? I'm just looking for the older bits of uh, software that need to either be removed or updated, that sort of thing, to be in compliance with this week's CVEs that came out that told us that there's, um, there's something to watch out for from a security standpoint. So uh, I won't show you how to change the filter there, but we'll keep moving through here. So. Uh, through the center here, uh, you've got model age and devices OS. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So I can um, filter this list of, if I pull it up to the top, you can see the list of devices. So this is the list of all of the devices that, you're, that are in your inventory. And I can quickly filter. So let's say I want to see what are all of my uh, elite books that are over a certain age. So you can see the darker color here indicates older than five years. The lighter color, blue, is, is younger than five years. So. If I just click there, a single click, I can, I can filter down to just those devices across the top here. And that's true of the other filters within this widget. So the younger devices, the older devices, that's true of operating system. I can clear the filter and come over and I can see, I think I showed this one yesterday, um, Windows 7 devices uh, that I need to get rid of on my, yeah. on, on my network. And so This one's um, going to be helpful in the next three months, right? Yeah, yeah, as we get to end of life, yeah. yeah. Yep, so, uh, so that's a quick look on inventory. You want me to do help desk now or you want to wait? Can you show the filter, maybe? Yeah. Show a few yeah. filters. Yeah, sure. So this is the help desk. Uh, so it's a, it's a similar layout. You can see widgets are in slightly different locations. But again, you've got that list of all of your tickets that have been pulled out. And um, it's a little more powerful uh, example for help desk because there's kind of more dynamic stuff that you might need to do. You know, like who, who's assigned in what quarter and, and is this closed and which organization. If you've got multiple organizations in your help desk, you can kind of do all of that here. So I could focus on filtering down to just tickets for a specific organization, or I could clear that. I could do multiple filters using just control clicking. So I could say, for this guy, Whaley, I want to know which tickets are still open on him, and you know, quickly filter down that way. You can use uh, all of these different widgets to do the same kinds of things. So I want to see which tickets have uh, custom attributes set, or which tickets have a specific custom attribute value set. That sort of thing. So all this is like just single click. So once we've got this available um, in a template form, which I like to do, so make sure you sign up uh, as registered with this session or, or in the session yesterday, or contact us, come grab a card or something like that. We like to get these uh, the templates in you guys' hands so you can try it out, export, and see if it's got what you need, what else you want, those sorts of things. Can you show the, can you show the attributes with the multi the, the filter with the multi attributes so you can build a on the filter tab on the right hand side? Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the things you can do, so this is uh, this steps down a little bit more advanced. You can pop out the filters on the right here, and you can see a little bit more detail. Um, so I could do, I think what Francois was describing here is I could do like, if I clear all these filters out on the left, yeah, there we go. I could filter down to uh, a little bit more specific information. So I can grab multiple values at once. So I can clear this out. We could do. Um, we added in a field. So this is something that we added to the Cloud Help Desk application specifically for reporting purposes. So you can see this all comments uh, column here. So what we're going to uh, do for you on that export is combine all the comments across all of your tickets into a single field so that it's searchable, so it's easily searchable from a reporting perspective. So say I want to come in here and I want to know, OK, I know we use a specific uh, remote software. And every time um, we use that, someone makes a comment about remote software. And I want to see how many how many times we've done those in our remote software, remote session. I want to see how many times we do remote sessions. So you could come in here and search for remote sessions, apply that filter, and see which tickets have remote sessions mentioned in the common history. So it's a, it's a little bit more advanced um, filters, but you know, it's still just a couple of clicks and a couple of, a couple of characters. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's, okay. that's perfect. Uh, Racing remember, through here. During one of the sessions yesterday, one gentleman maybe is here today, I don't know, uh, asked us a question. It was actually about desktop and reporting. He says, I like the reporting in desktop, but I want to do a, a filter to have a report that has multiple 
uh, and or it was yeah that was you you remember the discussion so um, we would need to take a look but I'm pretty sure that system pretty would do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this is very interesting because what I like about Power BI it's just my opinion I'm not preaching for it's a free product you know, anyway you get the point what I like is that I know Excel pretty well I don't know that but the filters the way you filter which is pretty much 80% of your activity on that system maybe not 80 but 50% is going to be building intelligent filter to extract the data from all your tickets or all your inventory so a lot of what you're going to do is going to be filter based and those filters are the same type of filter uh, you can see the Microsoft kind of mindset as Excel so if you know Excel well I'm not saying you know Power BI well but you know the filters of Power BI pretty well and for me that's a big big time saver so that's really what I like in the tool okay my opinion um, I think we're good on reporting so like Ben said, if you want, so what you've, the two reports you've seen are template. There's only one. We've done one for the inventory data cloud, one for help desk. If you want those templates, make sure you sign up uh, for this session so we can scan your badge, and we're going to send this template to everybody. If you're not interested, just ignore the email, right? If you're interested, take the template, download Power BI, try it, come back to us, just reply to the email. It's going to be Ben and myself. Reply to the email and tell us what you think. I hate it, I love it, I like it, but I would like to be able to do this. Can we do it? Kind of stuff. And based on that, we may decide to go further in the productization, so to speak, of Power BI as an integration with both Cloud Help Desk um, uh, inventory online. And by the way, if it's in Cloud Help Desk, soon after it's going to be in Help Desk Server because, again, that's the, that's the beauty of the single code base. You develop it once, you get, you satisfy both audiences. Um, all right. Who's interested in the template? If we send, if you receive the email, who would do it in the, who would give it a check? All right. Yeah, okay. All right. Good, good. good to hear that. All right, quick time check. Let's go back to the slide. Um, that was reporting. Thank you, Ben. All right, we've done that. Deployments. Okay, a few words on desktop just in case. Um, so uh, at some point we talked about desktop ADO. That was about a, a year ago. Uh, and we, uh, so that was the normal. At, at this point we were thinking about the evolution of desktop and current version is 7.5 dot something. Uh, we said, all right, we're going to do an ADO. And we knew that performance was a big deal for many of you from a help desk perspective. Somewhat inventory, but help desk. A significant number of you struggle with the performance of desktop uh, help desk. I don't know if it's the case. Raise your hand if you're having kind of a slow or a very slow system on help desk. Yeah, you see? Uh, and we looked and tried, tried, trust me, these guys tried very hard. And you'll see some architecture diagram in a minute. Ben's going to go through that. But the engineering cost of significantly improving that performance would have been very high. And we said, we're not going to take this approach. We're going to take this, the approach of starting from the cloud help desk code base because that thing is designed to scale tremendously because, like I said during the keynotes, right? You run a multi-tenant software for, trust me, a lot of businesses run Cloud Help Desk, even though today it's kind of in the minority. There's a lot of these people. If you take that product you give into a single business, it should scale. I mean, this thing is going to scale, and you're not going to see the limit of it from a number of ticket perspective. And we said that's a much better. It's going to slow us down a little bit because we're going to have to redevelop features we had in desktop. Fair enough. But long term, that's a much better approach. And, and now with the v V1 that we released, um, uh, we feel very confident about that. So that's why we announced, long story short, that we're not going to further develop desktop. It's not going away. You can still use it. We encourage people to continue to download it and use it. Or just being transparent with you guys saying, don't be surprised. We're not using our engineering effort to develop more features on desktop. We would rather put them on developing a new solid basis. And the first version of that is Help Desk Server. That's the, uh, that's the uh, ID. Remember that one, product dash plans. We've, we're very happy about that. Many people ask us questions. Why don't you have a roadmap? Why don't you tell us what you do and don't do? There right, we go. Now we do. It's in this page. We maintain it every, I don't know, month. You can subscribe. If you do so, every time we touch the page, you're going to receive an email that tells you about the update of this page so you know what we're doing, what we're announcing, what we've done recently, and so on. All right, help desk server. I'm going to do this one, and if you if you want to do the, the next two one, Ben, if it's okay, the sure. one that are a little bit too um, technical for me, maybe, you want to say? All right, so we released that version um, uh, about three weeks ago, early September. Um, so uh, it has all cloud help desk features. Uh, there's a few that it doesn't have just because of just because of time. Basically, we said we're going to take the least important features. I'm not going to migrate them into um, 
help desk server, so to speak, because we'd like to have this done before Spice World. So that's kind of what was driving that. So uh, the knowledge base is not there. Um, the mobile app is not there yet. And the ticket import is not there. It's kind of not there, but it's kind of there. Um, because again, uh, the mobile app is different because if you run in the cloud or if you're an on-prem, the way you have the mobile app talk to you is different. So we had to redo it. That was a lot of work. Ticket import, to be honest, we don't have to redo it. It works the same way. We just haven't had the time to certify it. I've tried it several times. You've tried it several times. It works really well. So we're talking about importing ticket from desktop, help desk, to help desk server, from on-prem to on-prem, but from the old code base to the new code base, right? That's what we're talking about How here. many of you would use that? We use uh, import, you like need to keep my, I need my desktop tickets to make it to whatever the new system is. OK. Yeah. And then as far as the mobile app, how many of you guys use that? And it's like, I have to have that. Yeah, it's a great one. Well, don't have to? You, you do use it, but so, yeah. so who is who? So, who is saying if I don't have the mobile app, I will not move to help desk server? Okay. okay. All right. Okay. okay. It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, is there is there a possibility of moving to it and then importing the tickets later? So you have that data. Yeah, you can import it any time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. Yeah. It's not just like yeah. an initial setup step. Yeah, so yeah. nobody wants to, to lose it. There's value in there. You have all these issues. It's, it's an, we're going to have to do it. What I'm saying is, if you look at the doc, it says ticket imp If you look at the slide, it says ticket import is not there. It actually works. We haven't certified it. But think of it this way. That's a one-shot thing. You're going to do it probably once in your life. So you're going to you do it, spend an hour looking at the target as they've been correctly moved and blah, blah, blah. And if you're happy with it, that's it, certify or not. You've done your own certification, so to speak. So I'm not saying do something which is not certified because vendor products usually don't do that. Telling you if you're in a rush, or at least if you want to give it a try, give it a try, it works. So if we started out using the uh, virtual box client because you say tentatively later for the ESXi, yeah. we're a big VMware shop. Uh, <coughs> And reimport them. And pull them into the ESX. Yes. So probably what you could do is just pull the entire uh, virtual machine over. So, and the other thing is, so we like it's a, it's a similar situation. We haven't certified it for ESXi, but we know that there's some tools you can use to effectively like convert or uh, reconfigure the VM that you download from us, such an OVA file, to work with ESXi so, right now. And actually, there are some community discussions. When we released Help Desk Server, people started discussing, oh, ESXi, I want bare metal, blah, blah, blah. And some people have done exactly that. They've converted yeah. the OVEA into whatever the ESXi, and it apparently it works. We haven't done it, uh, but some people do it. Read the thread. Yeah. Uh, if you do, can't find it, ask us. We'll give it to you. But some people have, have, have done it, and it works. So I think you're in pretty good shape there. Yes? Enough what? Is there's not going to be an upgrade path? If I have a standalone machine running desktop, I won't be able to just upgrade to desk server. No, you can do it. You you will be able to do it. You will be able to export. Yeah, you can you can export your ticket from uh, desktop and import them. It's not into help desk server. Well, I mean, I mean on the same machine, I'm not going to be able to just upgrade the software. Oh, okay. Yes, I thought you were talking. No, that's not an upgrade. That's a completely different thing. One is installed on the machine. The other one is a VM in a hypervisor. So that's not a, that's not a smooth upgrade. It's a different product. It's a different replacement product. Okay, but you, you, but you have a, an actual non-VMware version of Help Desk Server, right? No. Oh. The only implementation of Help Desk Server is a virtual appliance, at least for now. All right, so now is the time for the question. Who is saying, I cannot move to help desk server if it's, an OV, if it's a virtual appliance, I would move to it if it was a proper installable software? OK, all right, five or six, decent number. Yes? Will there be plans to increase the import size? Yes. OK, I was going to go there. Right now, the import is because, remember, that's the same import from desktop to cloud help desk. It's been, it's been out there for several years, and it's limited to 200 megabytes. Um, and uh, so therefore, the one that I say is not certified by Twarks to help desk server is limited to 200 megabytes. It's the same code, it's the same target code again. Yes, we're planning to make it usable for now. It's actually next on the list of stuff we have to do. So I'm not giving any dates, but we're literally starting working about, uh, on it now. Yeah, many people said that. We know that. Yeah. It's a great point. All right, one more question, and we need to move forward. Yes. 
All right. So uh, yes, there are plans. It's not done yet, um, and we're having two. There's two options to do that. Either we 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 do the on-premisation, if I may uh, create a new word, right? What we've done is we've on-premised Cloud Help Desk and we've made it runnable on-prem. We could do the same with Inventory Online, make it runnable on-prem. That's one option. So you would have Help Desk Server on-prem integrated with Inventory Online, but on-prem, so to speak, right? The equivalent of Inventory Online, the one I demoed like 10 minutes ago, on-prem. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is, which would be much faster, obviously, would be to start from Help Desk Server and integrate it with Inventory Online online. It's kind of a hybrid thing. It would be kind of bizarre, but that would be much faster. So I'll ask you the question. If we did, at least first, Help Desk Server integrated with the Inventory Online that we have today, who would be okay for that? Okay. Who would not be okay for that and says, no, if I have help desk server on-prem, I need to have inventory on-prem. Okay. Okay. Last question. Uh, admin and text credentials are not shared with the community account. So when you, you will download that thing and start it on your virtual appliance, it will ask you to create an account uh, to basically create a login, the admin login of the help desk server. If you want, you cannot reuse your existing community account. You're going to have to create a new one. And every new admin or tech you will configure into the software to process your ticket is going to have to have an account which is separate from their community account, assuming they even have one. So we see people saying, it's actually good because my community is for talking to the, in the forum, and I want to use different logins for my help desk stuff. And some people say, why do you force me to have to? It's kind of a pain. So who would be OK with this? Uh, in other words, I don't mind recreating one login specifically for my help desk separate from community. Who would be okay with that? And doesn't mind, okay? And who says, that's a pain in the ass, guys. Why don't you let me reuse my existing login into help desk server? Okay, it's a little bit less, but okay, it's significant. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, you're gonna do these two, Ben? Yeah. Um, so, the OVA file that we've been talking about, the help desk server file that you download, um, it'll create a new virtual machine within, again, VirtualBox or whichever hypervisor you're using. Uh, the, the specs that it uses is 8 gigs, 4 cores. And we've been doing some testing recently, you know, it shifts pretty recently. We've been doing some testing throughout, um, trying to figure out effectively where's, what's the breakpoint, like how large can we get it before it starts having issues. Um, and I think the, during the course of maybe the last week or so, um, we got up to I think the math was like a couple thousand tickets per hour were being created, and uh, we were still seeing them flow through properly. Emails were flowing out, and you were getting your response uh, uh, notification emails and that sort of thing. Um, so I guess we'll have to come back next year and see if we can break it. Um, but so far, the performance is worlds better. You know, I think we gave uh, 20x better than the desktop application. Um, so I think we've effectively kind of solved the issue of the scale, the amount of tickets that you guys have flowing in. As long as you're not um, doing uh, thousands kind of an hour sort of thing, uh, you should be in good shape. And that was with uh, importing in a large number of tickets as well. So we had in mind that you guys would be coming from desktop, importing maybe thousands of tickets, and then starting to process new tickets as, as uh, folks ask questions and those sorts of things. So that's, a, that's the quick view of this stuff. Um, this is a comparison just to give you a sense of like how do we do this or why is it different, that sort of thing. You can see up here in the top right, that's the uh, architecture of the desktop application. It's very simple. There's an application. It's got a web server that sits on top of it, and it's got a SQLite database, which is a very small, not very robust database backend. That's what Desktop App has. Um, like Fr Francois was mentioning earlier, we looked at 8.0, what kind of changes can we make from an architectural perspective and bringing up the application to newer versions and those sorts of things. Uh, the amount of investment and time and effort to do that was greater than trying to start fresh, build a new application that specifically was architected to do this. Um, so we did that with Cloud Help Desk, and that's what you're getting with Help Desk Server. Help Desk Server has this more complex architecture. There's caching. There's a, 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 a larger scalable database than Postgres and that sort of thing. So that's, that's the purpose of this. So uh, one of the things that we, um, I think we discussed openly with you guys in the in community over the years was um, there's, there's, in this architecture, in the desktop architecture, there's sort of 
a, a pipeline issue, right? You've got requests that need to come through from emails coming from your users. You've got multiple administrators logged in. You've got all kinds of, you've got scanning happening in the background. All these things are sharing sort of a single highway. Um, and if you look at help desk server, you've got effectively more highways, right? You've got the ability for email to be processed concurrently while an administrator's uh, making a change to a ticket and sending out another message that's going outbound. All these things can sort of be happening concurrently. So that's what, uh, that's what we've done with help desk server. Can I add one more point on the previous, on the previous slide, sure. if you don't mind? Yeah. Previous one? Oh, the one before that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the test that we've done, we've fed up to 13,000. That's not the max. We're not saying on 8 gig, 4 core, the maximum is 13,000. Yeah, I want point. to insist on that. What we're saying is we've pushed it, just because purely simple time, we've pushed it up to 13. We fed 13,000 tickets in that system, and it didn't blink. The, the UI was super responsive. The email conversion email uh, ticket was normally fast. I mean, that's a PC, right? I mean, that's 8 gigabit. I mean, that's, that, that machine does that, right? So you can run that system on that machine. It's going to do 13,000 tickets I mean, in its sleep. If you want to say, how many is that? How, how much ticket is that? Is that a lot, not a lot? Well, if you created 35 tickets every day, night and day, every 24 hours, if you created about 20, 50 tickets per week, so maybe that tells you where you are compared to that baseline, it would take you about a year to get there. So you would be pretty much guaranteed that if you create a ticket at that pace, in a year you would be in that state with your 8 gig 4 core, and it would work exactly like it was working on day one from a performance standpoint. That's a baseline. Hopefully that helps some of you. Um, who has more than, let's say, 13,000 tickets in desktop, since this is the majority of the population? How many do you have? Who has more than 20,000? OK, who has more than 50,000? Oh, wait, so, uh, and you sleep well at night? <laughs> <laughs> 55,000. I, I missed the number. What's the number? We're pushing 55,000. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's good. That gives us a good, a good baseline, and and we'll t actually that's a good baseline to give to uh, to these guys. It says, all right, let's do 60,000 and see what it does. How many cores and gigabytes do we need to do I'll that? Be, I'll be at 60,000 probably in the third degree. Gotcha. Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll try that. That's a very very interesting baseline. Yes. Can I run multiple instances of this? We use help desk for our facilities department and for our IT department. Yeah. They're not going to be integrated and know, no, each, know each other. Right. It's your free software. Run it as much as you want. Okay. For some reason, I couldn't do it with the desktop. On the same machine? Yeah. Okay. On the same machine, I, well, on the same machine here, that would be fine. It, there's no same machine. It's a virtual appliance. So it's going to run in. Yeah. You, can run, it, you yeah. can run two in virtual box on this machine probably. I have never tried but. Desktop, not desktop, multiple desktop installed on the same machine, just don't, don't go there. That's pretty, pretty complicated. Yeah. But this, this one, I'm actually very confident we could do it. I you could do the same thing with desktop. You could run multiple uh, virtual machines, but now you're eating two point. Windows licenses, That's whereas with this. What I, did, I just built a filter that reads the subject line and tags and IT or facilities. And right. Yeah. Split them out okay. All right. We have one minute left. Perfect. We're done. Uh, that's the last slide, literally. Uh, if you're a desktop user, many of you are, what should you do? <gasps> Breathe. Nothing bad's going to happen. <laughs> First thing to do, um, make sure you're on the last one, 7500. It's actually not, sorry, on the last one, it's not 7074. It's 1. I think it's 108. 108. 7 5 0 0 Whatever the last yeah. one is, just make sure you're there. Because if there was a security patch to do, we would do it, and we would do it on the latest version only. So make sure you're, uh, you're on that one, so you could upgrade from, from that one. Uh, you, don't you don't have anything to do short term. It is still supported or still very much. I mean, look at the numbers of people who raised their hand. I mean, that's it. The answer is, answer is there. Suggestions for you uh, to test the inventory online as a potential replacement in the future if you are cloud friendly. We don't have a, an inventory online on-prem yet. We're not there yet, but we're thinking about it, and we'll see your, uh, your reaction moving forward. Um, uh, there is a built-in survey. If you test inventory online, again, that's the one I, I demoed 15 minutes ago. There is a built-in survey. Uh, the lower left corner says, tell us what you think. We are looking at the result of that survey. Take three minutes. Tell us what you think. That's going to tremendously help us. Now, if you're using desktop help desk, consider a cloud help desk. Again, if you are cloud friendly, just give it a try. 
download and test help desk server. Don't be surprised. It's the same software, again, on-prem and not in the cloud. When you know what, let you know what you think when you receive an email. If you use help desk server, there is an automatic email going on after about a week after you've started it. After about a week, you'll receive an email with a survey. That's Ben and I. Uh, and just take a few minutes, tell us what you think. Same kind of information we discussed here. Don't, don't be afraid. Just put text in that survey, and we'll read it and take that into account. You can also go to the same survey. You don't even need to install it. Uh, if you go to uh, community slash HDS help desk server dash survey, you'll get to the same. You'll get to the same point. We've discussed that pretty much when we discussed the PDQ deploy at the beginning. We're covered. There is this great session. It's at 10.45. It's literally in a few minutes. That's basically the support guys. Crank and Brandon are the support guys. They know a lot about desktop. They are the guy processing your tickets, mostly on, on desktop because that's where the volume is. And they're going to go into reporting, SQL query in the desktop database, some desktop stuff. So it's an even more technical session than, than this one. And um, that's it. We talked about that. Any last minute question? Yes. What's the purchase module? So, one, I'm currently running on prem, and all of my purchases for anything is tied to the ticket. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. No, this one is not done yet. That's a, that's a feature we're, we're considering. We might, actually, the idea we have is we might allow you to move that stuff into the contract <laughs> stuff, because between your purchase and your contract, well, it's kind of close. We would need to do some adaptations to the contract tool that you've seen, but that's the idea we, uh, we had. I don't know if that's something you'd be interested in, but right now there's no equivalent. The short answer is there's no equivalent of the, the purchase list that you have in desktop into help desk server, because it comes from the cloud help desk, and cloud help desk doesn't have it either. But we're thinking about it from a contract perspective. Yep. Can we do mapping on 